Good morning and welcome to the Leadership and Insurance Podcast. I'm your host, Alex Bond, um, and I'm very lucky to, to be joined by David from Foresight. Um, David, good morning. How are you? Great, Alex. Uh, great to be on the podcast. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about, I was a little bit worried that we were going to sink into a sea of um, very co- coordinated uh, backgrounds, uh, but but we can, if everyone looks top right, they'll, they'll get it right. But um, but yeah. look, no, thank you for being a guest. Um, and look, I always want to throw it over to my guest like, as, as, as first start. Um, it'd be great if you could introduce Foresight, um, who you guys are and what you, what you do. Yeah, totally. So uh, David Fontaine, CEO of Foresight, we're the leading middle market insure tech that uh, focuses on commercial industries, uh, in particular, um, safety critical industries. So think construction, manufacturing, agriculture, businesses that generally struggle to get coverage um, and are a little bit more complex than your, your SMB insure techs that you, you know you might know like Pi or, or Next. So we we like to think that we we pick up where Pi and Next leave off. So, you know, we're talking accounts that are over 50K in, in annual premium, right up to some of our largest accounts are in the millions uh, per year in annual premium. So mm-hmm. pretty meaty risks where um, safety and compliance is, is critical for these businesses as they get bigger. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and just for clarity, so workers' comp specific, is that what we're talking workers about? Workers' comp specific, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought I hadn't done my research then. I was like, we are talking about just workers' comp, but no, um, but no. Thank you. That's that. That's really, really clear. And and I like this sort of delineation and like the sort of you know where you're pitching yourself because I think we're getting to that. Well, we've been that way for a while, but I think the maturity level of insure techs is, you know, it's. I'll throw this over to you. It's not good enough to come in and say, right, we're going to do a workers' comp insure tech anymore. You've got to have a like we're we're aiming for this particular slice of of that pie. Um, whereas I think kind of some of the kind of earlier plays were were maybe too broad. Um, if I may be so bold as to as as someone that doesn't run an insure tech, it seems a it seems a bit bold for me to do that. But I wanted to get into sort of workers' comp because it's it's it has historically been quite a difficult class. Um, some carriers got it right, made lots of money. Um, how did your technology, um, how is the technology relevant to this? And how does it give you a particular USP in, in the market that you're looking at? Yeah, so I think, you know, that, 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 the answer to that is best just told with the story of the company in our genesis. Mm. So um, I actually lost a close mutual friend uh, that I went to college with um, early, I'd say around 2010, Mm. Uh, and unfortunately, after that 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 close friend uh, passed away, I had another buddy that um, I was friends with that that also you know another college friend, and we were both pretty pretty shocked by the the passing of this 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 friend of mutual friend of ours. And um, both of us had interests in workplace safety, risk management, um, insurance, and it really was the genesis. This 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 friend passing away of, of us putting our heads together and thinking. You know, hmm, how can how can we create a better incentive for businesses to improve their or you know and, and assist businesses in improving their workplace uh, environment and and compliance, and that put that led us to develop a risk management tool um, known as SafeSite. It's actually a risk management platform. It's one of, actually one of the leading risk management platforms in the United States. Um, digital digital risk management platform. So it has it has thousands of businesses every day that use it to manage their ocean compliance and their safety management on the ground, um, and and obviously streamline and see massive efficiency gains there and gains. Um, and so basically, so we founded we, we created this technology, this this digital risk management te- technology, and pretty soon a lot of businesses over in the US were using it, and that was generally because of the high uh, burden of compliance and and mm. high costs of insurance. Um, and, uh, you know, after, after operating that business for a number of years and, and seeing all the data we were collecting and seeing the results of how we were able to significantly improve, uh, customers, uh, you know, loss ratios, claim frequency, claim severity. Um, we basically, you know, figured that we could help, we, you know, we, we put two and two together and we're like, wouldn't would it be awesome if we could also help them reduce their premiums? Because a lot of our customers we were noticing were, making these huge, huge gains in their levels of safety and compliance, but not seeing it on the other end in right. terms of insurance savings. Mm. Um, and so basically that, that led us to uh, open up a small commercial brokerage that, that I actually ran for uh, a number of years just to really sandbox the ultimate InsureTech Workers' Compensation Program that focused on the middle market. 
Um, and after a number of years of running that brokerage, we, we shut that down and moved into the MGU space. And that's when we launched Foresight. We got some um, pretty awesome backing for some pretty big name reinsurers. And, um, you know, it's basically a, a, a uh, ground up, built from the ground up, specifically to to target this this in, this market segment we, that's known as the middle market. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. I thought it's a uh, yeah, it's obviously a very uh, sad start to a kind of uh, innovation journey. Um, but yes, yeah, this sort of a, a ultimate kind of reason for doing uh, doing things. I think um, it's interesting. Um, looking at that middle market i've had lots of conversations at the moment about middle market and it being the kind of underserved um i think there's a kind of it's this this is challenge that, that we have in in the kind of regulation that we put into a, any industry and this is not insurance specific um, the burden is always on the company um but very different abilities to kind of resolve that problem like if you don't have a risk management team and you don't have you know you don't have the internal resources so sort of technology seems to be the kind of uh the right solution for that um i, I i'm interested to, i really wanted to get into your uh distribution channel um because you were very um positive and and and, and very kind of clear about you, you you're using that broker the traditional broker distribution channels um that's not been popular with a lot of insure techs. A lot of insure techs have been trying to cut those sort of traditional channels out. And I just kind of want to understand like your sort of your choice, whereas other insure techs have been kind of much more resistant. Yeah, absolutely. So look, having having been brokers ourselves um, in the past, and and also you know prior to prior to uh, being a broker, having a risk management technology with thousands of of middle market businesses on the uh, on using it every day. Mm. And we gain a really good understanding of the relationship that, and the need for these businesses um, to work with brokers. And in our mind, brokers are absolutely essential. And that's because the risks that we're underwriting are inherently more complex. And the markets, um, you know, it's, it's probably the polar opposite of like when you consider the personal auto space where there's, mm. there's hundreds of, of, of carriers that will underwrite a personal auto policy. Um, when we, maybe even thousands, but when we, when we look at workers comp for the middle market, we're dealing with complex risks that may be, you know, they may be a little hairy. They may be a, a beautiful mess. So to, so to say, some are really clean others, uh, you know, you, you really need to sit down and, and look at it through a diff- couple of different lenses to get an understanding mm-hmm. of the business. Mm-hmm. And these businesses, when they go out looking for coverage there, you know, there's only, li- there's only a limited number of markets that will underwrite them. And the, the, mm-hmm. the bigger they get, the more complexity gets, gets built in. And so, that's really where we see brokers really being able to shine and really ha- being able to help these businesses navigate that space and, and figure out who the, you know, who who their contenders are, who's going to get them the best value, um, and and not just that, they're also becoming, you know, as part of um, the services they provide. You know, they they really are they 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 really they really can be pivotal in helping these businesses improve their claims history improve, sorry improve their claims performance include mm-hmm. improve their business performance so um, they're, they're they're a great resource for, for these businesses and I'd say the more in, inherently complex the the risk get or the business gets or the need for coverage gets the more value brokers can add so mm-hmm. and I mean tying it back to the to your, to your first couple of comments like it makes sense that all the first wave of insure techs, we're all focused on the there are a lot of SMBs, a lot of personal lines, because though you know we're generally talking about lower lower policy size, um, we're generally talking to things like speed to policy, convenience. Mm-hmm. You know, they're things that really matter. But for the you know, and that's that's a lot. And you know, I consider that low hanging fruit, right? You're looking at these these like these huge markets, these huge these huge markets, and then um, they're, they're relatively e- they're easier to underwrite. It's easier to to digitize. There's not as much, you know, there's not as much premium volume in there to, to warrant a broker's time, mm-hmm. and so it makes complete sense to, to to streamline those and have pure digital distribution and, and you know remove the broker from that equation because let's let's face it, brokers really probably didn't care that much about those those small lines anyway. They're probably just like a lot of the times, you know, they're bundling those in with with larger policies mm-hmm. um, because they need to 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 add the value, but. Uh, where we where we are in the middle market, that's where you know brokers are amazing. They really shine. They add a lot of value because there's just there's just that extra level of complexity, and sometimes they need an intermediary to navigate a complex space. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I 
I love that. And thank you for such a, a full answer, because I think, um, look, as someone who sits essentially in an intermediary role in my, in my business, you know, there, there, there's a there's a lot of call for us to be disbanded and, uh, you know, uh, technology can replace. And, you know, it, it is in that high value piece. I think the brokers really come into their own and, um, you know, build relationships. And, and, and to some extent, it's it's translating that risk data it's understanding risk you know if your role as a broker is, is is as a risk consultant essentially and to understand the complexity of a business um you know it, it takes the burden off the end consumer the client the business in question and, and there's a there's a way to navigate through that um you know the overly complex world of insurance um, particularly on something where it's a complex risk yeah and if, look if you put yourself in the shoes of the business owner and you think hey like you may have just been unlucky. Maybe you've had a few mm. years where just some unfortunate events happened at, in, in your workplace and they may have been, you know, you, you, may, have, you may be doing everything you can to, to stay in compliance and, and promote safety culture and things like that. But unfortunately, you know, sometimes adverse events happen in the workplace. And if, you, if I put myself in the shoes of that business owner and I'm looking for coverage and, you know, the, the traditional markets are going to look at your loss history and be like, hey, we're not, you know, this risk is out of ap- appetite. And sometimes, you know, broker, that's where you really need that broker to be in the middle and say, hey, no, like, this is this is what happened. And tell the story to in, in, in a way that the insurance carriers understand and underwriters understand that generally, you know, a business owner or, or a CFO or, you know, anyone who's making that policy decision, that's not their forte. They're, they don't talk to carriers every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, there's the brokers are, are you know, that intermediary is, is is so critical, especially in the middle market where we operate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that 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 sort of the, the understand that there's a lot of that as well. We always forget, I think, when people are dealing with some of these decisions that they're not insurance experts. They're not. They don't know what's important to carriers. But going back to the sort of um, the the sort of safe site technology as well, um, does that allow people to sort of tell a picture of okay, the the claims history tells a certain picture. But surely, um, I presume as well, it allows you to say, right, but since that, we've implemented X, Y, Z, you know, like we've, we've, we've taken those uh, things and go forward. And, and is that part of the picture that the broker can paint as well as is, is what's been done since then to, to mean it's a better risk? Because um, arguably, you could come off the back of a claim situation and, and be a better risk going forward because, because of the learning experience of that claim. Yeah, absolutely. So, look, we, what we do, so, SafeSide drives a lot of value to these to our policyholders, and mm-hmm. fundamentally, how we connect all that is with what we a patented uh, machine learning uh, score that we've created called the SafeSide Safety Score. Mm-hmm. And that why that score is so cool is it basically is a live indication of the levels of safety and compliance on the ground level in the business. And what's scary when you think about it is. You know, OSHA compliance in general is, at a, is an all-time low. It's like, I believe it's a, you know, the latest data we looked at, it was around 40% nationwide. Wow. Um, and so a lot of these carriers that, you know, they're underwriting risks purely off the loss history with no understanding of, you know, ver- or very limited understanding of what's going on at the ground level. They may send traditional, you know, traditional loss control has its purpose and we, we certainly utilize it. But, you know, these loss controllers in general, the, the majority aren't on prem premises full-time they're, they're mm-hmm. showing up maybe once a year once a quarter mm-hmm. going through some checklists t- checking things out and then you know off they go um and so that's that's that really doesn't give you a great understanding of what's actually happening day to day in the business and what we what we allow the insured to do and like how we empower the insured is we basically allow them to um participate in safe site and this this technology that we we roll out and it's 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 co- it's complementary it's it's basically built in it's bundled with every policy that we underwrite um and we help them you know paint a perfect picture of and you know basically almost like a personal trainer for safety and risk management and compliance you know we kind of get them into shape so that we could they and they get this score and that score is like gives them an idea of how they can directly save in their premiums or basically gives them a path to saving at the next renewal period. Mm-hmm. So even though, um, you know, the experience modifier is the, is the main, is the, is basically the, the industry um, norm of how businesses can connect their loss history to what they get, what they get, what they get charged for print uh, for their policy. Uh, but that's a three year lagging indicator. So they can have an adverse event or a series of adverse, adverse events, clean everything up and be a really good company 
but they're still they're still getting penalized for three years and every carrier is mm. going to look at them the same for the next three years because that x mod is still going to be that that's you know it takes three it, it, it actually gets more adverse over the three years before it gets better wow. so um you know what we get what we're ultimately doing is we're we're, we're allowing these um insureds to demonstrate hey we're, we're a good business we do what we need to do we're ocean compliant we, we, we care about our, our workforce you know we want to make things better um and that's 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 something that 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 score that the we see the score the broker sees the, the score and we're all in it together we're all trying to like help them get get a higher score and then at renewal our underwriters can consume that that score and deliver um deliver you know relief premium relief and and more accurately price price their policy within 12 months rather than three years mm. so you know they can they can get savings a lot faster and I'd say fair, like fair competitive pricing where without the score, you know, and, and traditional markets, they'd, they'd be getting punished for at least three years. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, um, it's, a, and it's, it's a really good way for us to, to really help dial in these companies and deliver a lot of value to our policyholders. Mm. It comes back to that sort of um, transparency piece as well, doesn't it? And, 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 and just, you know, the evolution we've seen of yeah, having genuine up-to-date information. I mean, the sort of three-year lag time of, of the sort of correction, it's just not, it's almost not acceptable in, in you know, in, in this sort of modern world that we live in. We've got these data points. We've got the ability to kind of have up-to-date information. Um, we need to have it. So we're pricing accurately. Um, and it reflects on a trend. And I, I know that you and I uh, spoke very briefly on this, is that I've seen this sort of, the application of this thinking, not technology, but thinking in things like ESG and, and trying to underwrite a, a portfolio that's ESG compliant um, in that part of any offering like that, and the same with cyber, is you have to give the insured tools to make changes on their own. Other, otherwise, the sort of risk is never improving. And therefore, uh, it's about education. It's about openness. And then you can get that sort of accurate data and you can price accurately because um, no one's going to price in a way that's um, you know, not profitable or, or certainly not aiming to. But, um, but yeah. we, we, we have to change the way we look at the data. Otherwise, we're going to have the same results we've always had. Yeah, and I also, you know, I think a big part of it is about sustainability. Like when you're delivering, when you're when you're really looking to assist the business in improving their risk profile, and um, you you really what you're doing is you're helping them build a better business. It's going to be more sustainable over the long term. Like yeah, everyone's familiar with the labor shortage over here in the US and, and globally mm-hmm. due to COVID, and it's got it got you know it was bad before COVID. It got even worse after COVID, mm-hmm. and so you know we there's. There's a there's a there's a there's a knowledge gap. There's a there's a skilled labour shortage. There's everything you can think of that makes it makes complete sense to keep workers safe, keep them doing what they're good at, and mm. you know keep these businesses in business. And insurance is a great tool to do that. Like insurance is there for a reason. And mm. without it, like this age old saying that everyone that's in the insurance industry always says, like without insurance, there is no business because mm. like people need to be protected against risk. And um, I think this. You know, this, we, it's been called, a lot of people are talking about it now, this new wave of InsureTech, InsureTech 2.0. And really, you know, we're, and we like to think we're, we're one of the companies that are at the forefront of it in terms of, you know, we're really focused on delivering sustainability to these, to our policyholders. And it's not just about making it more convenient, making it easier for them, which we do. That's kind of table stakes these days in InsureTech. Mm-hmm. It's got to be easy. It's got to be digitized. It's got to mm-hmm. be streamlined. Um, it has to be a pleasure to work with us. But the, we, where we think where the insurtech space is going is really delivering a, a level of value and a level of sustainability to these businesses that you know no one's seen before. That traditional you know traditional incumbents have, haven't achieved, have failed to achieve, and that's where we see a lot of the opportunity in the next five years. Mm-hmm. Does it does it have an impact as well on the stickiness of clients? Because one one thing that we talk about a few times on the podcast is that if your only interaction with a with a with a insured is at the you know policy renewal date or or any claims situation then um we always talk about claims being the shop window and that's great and you can handle a claim well but um giving them more tools using more kind of interaction does it improve the interaction therefore kind of uh improve that relationship does it have a richer relationship off the back of it one would assume absolutely absolutely you know our our technology is um it's it's really you know it's 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 so inspiring for us when we 
meet new insureds and we, we talk to them. We know the pain points. Like, like I said, we, we, were, we were a broker for a number of years. And before that, we also had the risk management platform. So we've seen thousands of businesses uh, in, in, the, in our space. And we just know how hard it is to navigate the compliance world, to navigate the safety management world, you know, to understand what you need to be doing, what is best practice. It's, it's tricky for these businesses because, you know, they, they, they need to make money. Like that's the, <laughs> that, you know, they have to deliver their service, right? And sometimes mm-hmm. it can be a lot of noise, um, mm. you know, the, and the regular level of regulation. And, and so they could quite often, you know, they're, they're, they're navigating this, this marketplace. And, you know, when we talk to them and we explain to them what our technology does and how it's going to help their business, they're like their eyes light up. And they're mm. like, you know, this is this is amazing. We've been we've been struggling with this and searching for something that's going to help us out with this. And you guys are delivering it with our coverage that we're you know we're paying for anyway. And you're going to help us get a clear path to savings. Um, and so that moment, you know, you almost guaranteed that they're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they, they see the value. They they understand the value prop. And, but you know, that that's not always the case. Some some in a, in a, in a way like um, the way that we you know. We, we come on at it sometimes. Our technology is almost like a bit of a, or our program, like our, our approach to risk management and safety uh, is almost like a forcing function because some businesses might see it as a distraction. They might say, hey, like this, you know, we're, we're already doing everything we think we're, that, you know, we already think we're, we're good enough. We don't need any help. Thank you very much. Or mm-hmm. um, they might see technology as, as being a, a distraction or like the, the cost of change management being too high, which is, which is fine. Like it's, a, it, for us, it's, um, you know, that maybe they're, they're not businesses that fit our appetite and they're better off with a, with a more traditional incumbent. Mm. Um, but we certainly, you know, we had our first, we've had our first, just to, I guess, to, to go full circle, we had our first um, series of renewals recently. So we've just hit, I think, month 14 in the market um, in terms of underwriting. And we've seen a, a, a crazy high level of renewal rate and, a, and, a, and our, the technology adoption rate within our policyholder base is, more than ninety percent, wow. um, which is which we're really happy with for our first year. Where you know we, we obviously want it to be one hundred percent is is what our goal is. But you know month one and two of underwriting, you can imagine as a brand new MGU where we're just finding our feet, finding our distribution channels, working you know mm-hmm. educating our brokers. Mm-hmm. There's there's some things that slip through the cracks, but we're we're expecting as we go on this year, we're going to trend towards the the high nineties, um, which is really encouraging. You know for us, it it, it just shows that. People loving loving our service, loving the value proposition, loving the technology, and really, you know, they, they're getting if they get if they're getting enough value out of it, the service. Why would they switch? You know, it's yeah. it's yeah. um yeah. yeah yeah and but it's but it, it goes into that theme, doesn't it? We, we you've got to give people more, and I think I think that's exactly what I looked at it. And you know, some people look at it as uh, almost like great technology and uh, helps us with a risk and we get free insurance or it's like insurance for free technology. Yeah. Yeah, so it's <laughs> yeah. kind of like, exactly. sort of like, it's like two yeah. sides of the coin. It'd be really interesting to see how, if customers look at look at it from a different angle and like how they perceive it. But uh, I was thinking, as you were saying, this is like some resistance. I was thinking, probably wouldn't want to ensure the people that are a bit resistant to visibility on their risk. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like you, yeah. You, yeah. Um, I mean, we're, we're, we're always, we're always up for helping people out and helping businesses out, but I mean, yeah. it's their decision at the end of the day who they go with. So sure. I mean, if that's the result for us is that we end up writing better risks and that's great for, you know, that's great. Yeah, it's all good. Um, I just wanted to ask you about the office locations, the geographies. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, shoot me if I'm wrong, but there's sort of three locations currently. Um, and I just wanted to ask, like, why those geographies, um, you know, specifically um, as a sort of starting point? Yeah, so when we started, um, we launched Foresight at the start, basically just before the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, and prior to that, we actually had a, a, an office in uh, on Market Street in San Francisco. Like, that was our, that was our headquarters. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, Having run, we, we ran our brokerage prior to launching Foresight from San Francisco. We, we ran SafeSight, our, our risk management technology from San Francisco. And prior to COVID and the pandemic, it was like, it was a real challenge to, to A, find insurance talent in a, in a localized area or B, convince people to move to, <laughs> to a city like San Francisco where, you know, there's a bit of a, I, I, I personally love it here, but, you know, it's yeah. not everyone's forte. Yeah, uh, and it's it's expensive. I was going to say it's not so, cheap either. <laughs> it's not cheap. No, it's certainly not cheap. And so it it was kind of pretty eye watering for people that you know make considering that decision, especially when we found good talent that wasn't wasn't in the Bay Area. 
And then after COVID, uh, you know, once COVID hit and we, we started, we, we, ran, we, we closed our Series A, which was a um, $13 million round led by Builders VC. Mm-hmm. And we basically started putting the, putting the um, pedal to the metal in terms of launching Foresight and hiring. And we, we required a lot of talent um, and a lot of people to join. And really trying to, you know, the full remote model really worked in our advantage because all of a sudden, in, in, instead of having this conversation about, hey, we're going to uproot, you know, uproot your lives, come to San Francisco. It's, I know it's probably a lot more expensive than when you're living it, where you're living, but trust me, the opportunity is worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, it you know, which is it, that that conversation when we're recruiting and, and finding new talent quickly changed to, hey, you, you're good where you are and we still have an amazing opportunity. We're still building an amazing business here and we can do this remotely. Um, and that really enabled us to start hiring nationally and start really picking and attracting the best talent, best in class talent and, and mm-hmm. a lot, you know, making it a lot easier. So right now we have a full remote model, but we have, uh, we have satellite offices um, in, in different locations across the, across the nation. So we, you know, we have some, we got, a, we got an office in New York, small office in Brooklyn. We've got a small office in San Diego, Still, we, have, we still have a small office here in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're smattered across the country, close to where we have a um, concentration of staff. And the reason, and the reason why we have this kind of satellite set up now is really just a as a as a place where our our, our staff can get a break from home. Because as you know, a lot of people working yeah. from home got a big fit. If you have a family, or just it can get it can become it can actually become a bit of a grind. So. Mm-hmm. Um, we find this kind of hybrid model with these satellite offices set up really allows our, our staff and our talent to pick between, hey, I want to, you know, I'm going to work from home for three days this week. Then I'm going to go into the, the office for two, two days and catch up and workshop with, with some coworkers. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we, we think it's the best of both worlds um, yeah. and will, you know, allow us to keep hiring best in class talent. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that blended model is like, yeah, I think mean, I think everyone's kind of got to that sort of conclusion. But it's really interesting. We sort of we had a bit of variance at the start, and everyone's really embracing being at home. And um, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think everyone wants to sort of that blend from from a different perspective. I've just actually taken office space and haven't had office space for years, and 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 just because it was, you know, to get out of the house. Um, mm. And then I'm hiring people that are a bit younger, so that they they're living in shared accommodation. They've got those pressures. But then I remember sort of having that conversation with a friend of mine who's got three young children and he went there's absolutely no way i'm working from home every day you know <laughs> <laughs> totally. i think so, there's a correlation to the more kids you have the more or less you know yeah less, exactly uh, exactly yeah. Um, but it was so it's so interesting because i think everyone has their reasons and 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 what and but the the talent thing for me for some of the worst in the talent field for years it's dri- driven us mad because how do you even find talent that's prepared to uproot it's such a m- manual laborious process because you've essentially got to continue just to reach out ask these questions for the perfect candidates go would you move to san francisco yes no yeah. i don't know we've got to run past the family whereas now you can say we've got an office in san francisco we don't need you to move there um but presumably the options there as well so you've got this it's you can genuinely have a conversation about best in class talent whereas before it would be like best in class talent that's prepared to relocate and and that is not the same pool of talent so it's really interesting um to see how that's changed um we touched on raising capital there, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, raising investment. Um, you, you've closed out a very large round recently. Um, this might be an unfair question to ask you because you, you probably say the valuations on the money, but um, you know we've seen some really big valuations in the market, um, and then we've seen the kind of drop off on, particularly on the listed entities. Do you think we're in a bit of a bubble in this sort of investment in insure tech, or, or maybe even fintech more broadly? Or what's your take on the kind of investment market out there at the moment? I think we're, you know, I think we're, we're dealing with a, 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 I'd say like a quarter at the moment of uncertainty. It, mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of uncertainties around the, the the public markets and you know, political, politically, what's going on, and, and just everyone's, I think, a bit highly strung over just a, the third wave of COVID just being over. Mm-hmm. So you know, I feel like we're, there is a little bit of a pause at the moment, but I don't think it's going to sustain. Um, when you think about fintech and Insure tech, and let's just let's just talk about insure tech, right? Yeah. There's tens of thousands of lines of insurance, um, and when you think it, and that, that have basically haven't been innovated for thirty plus years. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you think, you know, we, 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 the first wave of insure techs, like I mentioned before, they've kind of just scratched the surface in terms of the low hanging, super low hanging fruit, very broad policies. 
but really there's there's you know it's a very deep well that I think we've only just tapped the top of um, and so I do I think that that it's a bubble I don't think that fintech or insurance tech's going anywhere and I think that you know we're having a bit of this, this first quarter is, there's a little bit of uncertainty about this first quarter especially in the United States right now but there's been a record number of um, you know what what count is that the VC the VC market you know there's been a record number of funds raised by VCs mm-hmm. in, Q, in, in, in in 2021 those VC, those 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 funds have to deploy most of them have to deploy their capital in the next five years out of those funds yeah. raised so there's no yeah. shortage of capital coming into the market um, and so I think will we see valuations maybe cool off for maybe a quarter is what I'm what I'm predicting but I mean it's there's a lot of good things. There's there's a lot of sort of questionable things happening in the markets at the moment, but there's a lot of um, really good signals that it's like we're going to hopefully ride this out and then we'll, we'll be back to business as usual. And there's just so many great ideas out there and so many great businesses and entrepreneurs out there. And like I said, like there's potentially te- like there's thousands of lines to innovate on mm. um, that haven't been innovated on yet. So it's just a matter mm. of time. Yeah, I, I I I would echo that. I think there's been some, um, I think it's been some overvaluation of, of 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 some companies for sure, and I think for a certain extent. But what what the intriguing trend that I've noticed is that I completely agree that sort of that low that low hanging fruit. Um, you're going to see more innovation in B2C lines to start with because it's um, it's essentially about distribution. We haven't had true digital experiences and now you can build those in. Um, but what I'm starting to see is, you know, we're seeing businesses that are focusing on things like reinsurance, which are insurance specific, you know, pure mm. Um, big ticket and that innovation has been really really slow because it's kind of going up the value chain so so it's interesting that we're starting to see that kind of evolution um you know people used to say that we couldn't do commercial lines through um the sort of insure tech lens we're seeing that that's not true so it's just we're sort of increasing up the value chain certainly um and and we're seeing more diversification in what what insure tech looks like um whereas the first wave is definitely about distribution uh, i would say and the second you know maybe we're getting into the kind of more high value stuff that we know that insurance is is, is very good at doing um and and maybe it's about tools but i like i like your your business is interesting isn't it because it's a it's a blend of you know some traditional distributions good relationships with brokers and then just giving better tools to the business for accurate risk assessment pricing and 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 value added and 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 i think we're going to see more and more of these sorts of businesses um do very well um because you're actually offering a value add in in a in a line of business which just hasn't had that previously yeah so you know i think we're not we're, we're certainly not the growth of all growth at all cost model that we've seen with some of the you know the early yeah, insurance techs sure. but we're certainly like we're high growth and some of our numbers certainly rival or exceed some of these early insurer techs mm-hmm. um in terms of our first year of underwriting but we're really about, like I mentioned before, sustainability, really paying attention to our loss ratio, making sure we got healthy, you know, healthy fundamentals in the business. And just to talk about, you know, how insurtechs on the, the ones that went public have kind of generally been getting punished over the last year. Um, I think that's a that's largely a result of uh, like a byproduct of that growth at all costs mm. strategy where, you know, they it, it, it helps them get to an IPO. But then once they IPO, you're in, under the scrutiny of the public markets. And, you know, mm-hmm. they're going to look at you with, with a pretty pretty magnified lens and and it's they're pretty quick to call uh non-sustainable on when you you know your cost of acquisition might be in the hundreds of dollars yeah uh, and you, yeah. You know, yeah five year five year lead time to to make up the cost of the the acquisition of the policy holder so it's it's um there's certainly but i you know do i think those businesses are going to survive i think they certainly are i think there's there's definitely a lot of innovation there for them to continue to improve on and there's definitely a lot more growth that can be had in those spaces um but uh, you know, I feel like th- this where we are, we're 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 trying to we're, we're really focusing on making sure we got good fundamentals, so that when we when you know if we do go to the public markets at, at one stage, we'll we'll be going there with really solid numbers and, and a business model that is you know inherently makes sense and um, it's very sustainable. Mm, I think that's uh, I I'd forgotten how I'd written it. I, I knew I'd written down a question that was similar to this, but I, I think I put it there. The first wave was supposed to be like insurance is broken. The second wave was oh, it's it's old fashioned, and the third wave is it seems to be exactly that that sort of evolution of 
traditional um, thinking on insurance, traditional values, you know, <laughs> something as old fashioned as underwriting profit, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then, you know, uh, but that, that sort of blend of technology, um, which you guys sort of encapsulate perfectly. Um, I wanted to talk about the team and the blend of that. Um, obviously I've looked at the team sort of blend of insurance and tech experience and, how do you marry those cultures? Because they don't always kind of, they're not perfect bedfellows at the best of times. Um, so you've got, you know, tech people in an insurance focused business and non, non-tech people in a, in a sort of tech driven business. And I was, I was wondering how you tackle things like building a culture, how you communicate, you know, how, how, do you, how do you make that work for you? I think, you know, and this analogy might not be the best analogy, but I feel like a lot of the insurance talent out there might have been like, you know, a person that's been in a a, a bad relationship for a long time. (laughs) And, you know, they might have finally broken it off with their, you know, this other person and which is maybe the incumbent carrier or incumbent insurance business. And then they find this this technology, you know, this insure tech thing and like, oh my God, this is like this white, this, this insure tech concept is like, everything that I was unhappy with in this, you know, working for this incumbent car- mm-hmm. like incumbent insurance company, they're kind of like, adri- like flipping on its head and addressing all these, all these things that were making me not motivated mm-hmm. and not super interested in, in, you know, in working in the insurance industry. So I feel like um, it's been in terms of, you know, we, we, we are largely 50, 50 tech and insurance. I can tell you that all the insurance talent we have uh, have, have been absolutely delighted to join an insure tech company um just you know we're obviously incumbents have a lot more at stake uh, in terms of they've been around for hundreds of years in some cases Mm -hmm. um you know it's not easy it's not easy to uproot and change culture when you're dealing with 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 such an established entity whereas we're able to obviously build things from the ground up and really build a build a exciting culture and a a productive workplace culture here that people are excited to come to work and, and be part of something big and we're, you know, we're, we're working our way towards some pretty big things. And that's really exciting. It's really motivating. It's super, like, you know, it's super motivating for me. Um, and, you know, I know it's super motivating for our team. And so um, it's really been, it's been, it's, it's been really uh, a lot of fun bringing people on board from incumbent carriers and um, sort of showing them the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Because a lot of, a lot of people that, you know, they've, they've been doing the same thing for 10, 15, 20 years and to have like a fresh, a fresh approach uh it's pretty it, it seems like it's it's pretty invigorating so mm-hmm. um yeah i think i think they've embraced in, in short answer is i think a lot of our insurance all the insurance person that, uh, talent we have on our team have certainly embraced the tech um you know the tech ethos to 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 running a, a technology company and i think it's a really good marriage it's a really good blend Mm-hmm. I like I like that analogy. I might take that one. Um, <laughs> but but no, I think it's a good analogy um, uh, because I think I speak to some super smart people in the Cumber market, and I always talk about this. I've, I've been sixteen years in, in insurance um, search, and the last three have been in insure tech. Um, the challenge is finding the people that are open for, you know, a sort of faster paced environment. Um, you know, not as linear pathways, um, but. A lot of people I talk to, the frustration has been, it's not about, it's not even about innovation or as per se, it's just that when you join insurance, you fit into these very kind of na- narrowly defined roles. You're very, we, we love specialism in insurance. So, you know, if you're an underwriter and you underwrite a certain class of business, it's like anything you probably haven't thought through at the start of your career where, you know, you need to position yourself and then you find yourself 10 years in as a, niche class business underwriter or claims person and 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 just your know, pathway is really just set out in front of you it's it's there mm. are very few options and there's there's not that flexibility that hyper growth scaling businesses offer um so more than anything it's just the lack of ability to sort of find a new avenue um and i think that's where i've seen insurtechs embrace is just say right do you want to take your traditional skill set do you want to use it in a different way um and yeah, there's so much excitement around that. Um, whether they're whether they're the right fit for it culturally, or they're too sort of um, lost in the slaves to some of the kind of pace of change that we see is is a different question. Um, but I'm really conscious of your time, so I just wanted to ask you sort of a one one last question, and then um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you go. But um, where do you think we might be? Um, 
where's the big leap forward? Because a lot of what we're doing is we're kind of offering tools and we're making it better. Um, do you think we're going to see those those big leaps forward? And if you've got any guess of what that might be, uh, and I appreciate how vague that question is. <laughs> no, it's a great question. And, you know, um, I think that there's there's definitely going to be multiple, like, and to your point, there's going to be different stages, different levels of innovation that's going to be deployed over the next um you know, a dec- couple of decades. And mm-hmm. I, I don't know if you recall when Insured Tech came out, everyone was like blockchain, 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 like blockchain is going to turn insurance on its head. And yeah. um, even though like I'm a big advocate for blockchain and technologies, we haven't really seen a lot of innovation in insurance in terms of uh, blockchain. In fact, I mm-hmm. think most of the innovation that has come to insurance to date by the first wave has all been marketing based, like a yeah. better, basically a better mousetrap. Yeah. Um, but I think that's basically like, that's the, that's the start of the evolution uh, and, you know, I, th- I feel that there's a lot of gains to be made and I feel like we're going to see a lot, you know, really going to see a lot of improvements um, or innovation in, in, I think, working with regulators. I think that, um, you know, regulation regula- regulation's there for a reason um, and it's there because what we, the, the service that we provide as an insurance company is, is, is fundamental to, to businesses operating. Mm-hmm. However, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of gains that, that and and improvements to technologies that are delivering and that you know regulators might not be up to speed on. And I feel like what, what like over the course of the next ten years, insurance technology companies are going to be working pretty closely with regulators to improve um, and evolve those regulations to make it better for the for the for the customer for the policyholder. I feel like it's going to deliver a lot more value and it's going to um, make things a lot like pricing and uh, a lot more flexible. Mm-hmm. And so I, th- I feel like that's going to be a big, you know, you, you mentioned before, like you're seeing, you're starting to see some action on the, on the reinsurance space. That's a, that's like to, to the public, that's a, that's a broadly unknown area. And same, mm-hmm. same with in, even investors, like, you know, you have to really work in top, at the top levels of, ins- of insurance to understand reinsurance. Um, and so, and, and again, that that's, there's there's a there's a heavy amount of regu- like most re- there's a heavy amount of regulation in, in that space and and regular like regulators uh you know they're they're touching everything and I feel like it's gonna you know the next wave you know to answer your question I really feel like it's going to be with technology companies working with regulators um, and sort of evolving those you know involving that area that a lot of it hasn't been changed again changed in decades and so you're going to see greater flexibility better pricing um and it's just going to be better for the consumer um mm. so you know whether or not it's going to be I, i'd say it's, we're probably going to see some easing of regulations um and some regulations adapting to uh, you know adapt for these new pricing models um or these new ways of underwriting or you know these new policy lines mm-hmm. um which is which is really cool mm-hmm. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. Yeah, I, th- I think I think that, yeah, no one's sort of actually. I've sort of tried to start introducing that as a question to answer now, and I think regulation is a huge part to play in like how we can innovate because it's the it's the box in which we can do that in really, and it's just if, if we can change the parameters of that box, and we're going to change the innovation we can see. Um, David, you've been really generous with your time, uh, particularly for a man who's raised an awful lot of money in the last, uh, uh, or at least early announced it. Um, but presumably, lots of hiring going on. People should reach out to you if they're, if they're interested in going on an exciting journey in insure tech. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we tripled our our team size last year, and and this year we're we're looking to at least double again. So it's going to be you know we're hiring a lot of a lot of good people, and you know technology on the technology side and on the insurance side. So you know, always always interested chatting with someone who wants to make the jump and you know wants to work for a, for an insurer tech that's got a lot of purpose and the, uh, what I consider awesome vision. So um, yeah, love to if you hear of anyone, please reach out. Brilliant, brilliant. David, thank you so much. Um, Pleasure to have you on a guest. Thanks, Alex. Cheers.